<laughs> is this thing on? Yeah, sounds like it. So thanks for the introduction. Um, maybe a few words to myself before I start. Um, I am a computational biology PhD student in Timo's group. And um, my science is concerned with analyzing large uh, data sets from different sources. So imagine we have heard today about the pain of like reliably accessing one data set. Now imagine doing that without actually being able to talk to the people that they created this data set. So this is what I am doing uh, in my PhD. Um, sounds painful, sometimes is also. So I will uh, talk about another thing today that I'm quite passionate about, and this is like creating tools that other people can use um, to build cool stuff. For example, data visualization. And I will also uh, talk about the FS Lab ecosystem. I mean, uh, I'm talking about writing libraries for it, but what is it actually? You heard the name FS Lab today a few times. Um, so let's first maybe talk about what it is currently, what I think it should be. I think we should also have a uh, discussion about that, and I hope um, uh, some of you will also put your thoughts on that board over there for, for it. Um, then I will talk about a library that I am maintaining uh, called Plotly.net, and I will also try to like derive some learnings from that library by maintaining that library um, that we can maybe use to build other libraries for this FS Lab thing I will talk about. So what it currently is, FS Lab, um, is we were approached as the, like, uh, Timo's group uh, in late 2022 to um, take this GitHub organization called FS Lab and create a project incubation space for data science in F-Sharp. And it was, like, envisioned as this center of gravity um, but what we, I, I mean, I'm a computational biologist, not a physics physicist, but I think for having a center of gravity, you need some mass right there in, in the middle for other things to orbit around it. And this is what I think um, this approach was lacking so far. And um, what I think, and also other people think FS Lab should be, um, is a high quality cohesive data science stack, like with a high quality core and then other projects orbiting around this. And when we have this core thing, we can like start creating a community around that, using that. So this is not an idea that I came up with, uh, with myself, also actually not with the universe physics analogy. So the R program programming language has a thing called tidyverse. Um, which is a group of high-quality R packages that have like a similar design philosophy on how to handle data. And if you look at this, um, you saw a similar uh, cycle on Timo slides before today. Um, what they also focus on is creating tidy data. I think some of that has to do with the quirks of the Arc pro programming language, but um, yeah, I think we already heard today many times that you will not receive tidy data most of the time if you're doing data science, right? Um, yeah, and so they also have this like extended universe around this, these core packages, um, which they do not adhere to this like strong opinionated design philosophy, but are also like mentioned on the web page, for example, for the tidyverse and stuff like that. So um, what can you learn from that? Um, I think some of the things the tidyverse is concerned with are not problems. We can like do a one-to-one -one comparison to the F-sharp programming language because they are really different. Um, but um, some other things we can definitely learn from it. So. What R has going from it is a, for it is a large community, um, a large amount of packages, also in this tidyverse. Um, but it lacks a strong type system and also 
Um, until recently, I think they implemented actually a native piping operator in 2021, I think it was. But until that, you would have to rely on the pipe operator um, in the tidyverse or some other uh, uh, packages there. So we don't, luckily, don't have that problem in F sharp. We have a pipe operator, right? And yeah, so I think. Some of the things are uh, similar. We definitely need a visualization library, also libraries for data access, definitely. Um, but there we also run in our like first problems with this direct analogy because R is not a statically typed language. So what is actually a data frame in a statically typed language? I think there's the amazing deal library. I also use that extensively, but I also know many people that have like general concerns with uh, this type of working with data in F sharp. Many people actually like to make their domain model. I think we saw that today multiple times. And yeah, I think we should talk about this. How can we maybe like combine these two approaches to import and read data? And yeah, what we don't have currently also is like a common API design philosophy for like this core package. I think we are currently in the stage where we have multiple um, high quality uh, packages emerging, but not like having a um, focus on working well together. I think you saw one of those packages, I think is for, for sure F sharp stats, which also uh, tackles another problem uh, of the F sharp programming language because R uh, at its core is designed for working with data and doing data analysis. So it has like a high performance matrix implementation, stuff like that. We don't have that in F sharp, at least not in the like core F sharp um, language repository. So we have to create libraries for doing that. Um, so what I will talk about now is a visualization library called plotly.net. You have seen today some charts that can be created with that library. It is a um, type-safe, multi-layered abstraction library, basically built on top of a um, library called plotly.js, which is a <laughs> obviously JavaScript library. Some problems uh, immediately come from that, and you will see that in a minute. And um, especially like a the high API um, layer of that is heavily inspired by, by other um, visualization libraries, for example, fsharp.charting and xplot. So I said I think it is a high quality library. I think it has like, uh, seen some success, but you don't just have to take my word for that. So I try to do like a small data uh, analysis to maybe uh, put that claim onto a more solid ground, right? So what I thought about is what can be like a proxy for re uh, relative success in a uh, open source community. So the, because I, I don't capture any data of the people using my library, I don't think uh, many uh, libraries can actually do that or allow to do that. I also don't want to do that. Um, so what I came up with is, um, using GitHub stars for that. So sure, there is uh, obviously a bias in there because some projects are obviously not on GitHub. But um, at least inside, if we take this whole data set, the claims should be at least consistent inside that subset of like available uh, F-sharp programming uh, tools. So I use this amazing library, FSHTP. Uh, shout out to that one for, um, yeah, thanks, <laughs> to, uh, to, to, it, it offers this amazing um, computation expression to create uh, um, requests and send and re uh, receive those as a uh, JSON, which we can then dynamic, dynamically query. Um, I then like deserialized the results to, to this record type. The only important fields, I think, are the full name of a, rep, a repository, the amount of people that started on GitHub, and also for later um, when it was created. So uh, the data set we end up with is around uh, 27,500 repositories. And 
I think this is also in line with we, what you would expect. Most of those are like hobby projects of individual people. So you end up with a data set that is hugely skewed to like the low star count. So what I did is then, because if you would, sorry, if you would um, like start analyzing this data set already, something with 20 stars would be like way out there if you would not um, apply a filter here. So I focused on this subset of 5.3% uh, of repositories uh, that have more than 10 stars and later also more than 50 as well. And this data is also uh, <laughs> quite skewed into the direction of uh, a low star count. And then you have this, you can't see it on this plot. I will show you later better plots on the, uh, for that. There are these uh, small outliers in this range, which is why um, this plot is so wide. The, this one is obviously right here, the f uh, language itself, which is the most start repository on GitHub. Then you have the Fable compiler, which is like a <laughs> sub-universe uh, in the f uh, uh, space itself, right? So you would uh, 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 expect that um, to be quite up high up here in the stars. It's the second most start one. Then you have uh, integral tools like Paket, for example, also scoring very high. And Plotly.net is down here with, uh, on place 42 with around 500 stars. And if we look, take a look at the box plot on the side here, you can already see it is slightly outside of this whisker range here. So it's uh, um, falling into the range uh, above uh, 1.5 interquartile range. So it can be reasonably assumed that it's an outlier across this data set. So that alone should be at least some um, uh, uh, help to, to, to put data under my claim. But then I got a little bit sidetracked and also was interested in the um, age of a repository, if that does play a role on the success of the repository. So I have down here this uh, central scatter plot, which plots on the x-axis the age of a repository against the star count. You can uh, see all of the like OG uh, repositories up here. What I found very interesting are actually these two here, which are very young, but like in the top 10 repositories in, uh, regarding star count. Um, this is a uh, language server protocol implementation for Markdown. And this is a front end built in Avalonia for Vim, uh, NeoVim, I think. So uh, quite cool projects. Um, on the side here, I added, like, this is the box plot you already saw. So, like, the distribution across this star, uh, star count dimension, and the same uh, up here uh, for the age dimension. And I also think it's quite interesting that we uh, have more recent uh, repositories with a high star count than very old ones. So, it seems like people are creating uh, more successful F sharp repositories now than. 14 years ago, which is quite cool, right? OK. Uh, I also uh, tried to do a linear regression on this data set. So this is like this line here. But it doesn't, as you can see here, so we can explain like 2% of the variance in star count with the age. So it's <laughs> really not a strong relationship. And this also makes immediately sense because you cannot expect like to put a repository on GitHub put it there for 15 years and then have 500 stars without putting something in there, makes quite sense. OK, so I got a little bit sidetracked there. But I think GitHub stars can be used as a proxy for success. And based on that, I can back up the claim that Plotly.net is a successful library. It also was a nice uh, reason to show off some charts that you can create with that library already. So what are the reasons for this type of success? Uh, as you might remember, I want to like, derive some learnings from this for the FS Lab ecosystem, right? So I think um, there are uh, things that uh, I, as a maintainer or creator of this library, don't really have like, control over. And this is basically the perception of the library and like, uh, people that try to promote it on their own, right? So, creating blog posts, stuff like that. And I think you can also uh, can see the influence of stuff like that if you look at the um, uh, time evolution of the star count of the library. Because 
you can see here until like uh, late 2022 again, uh, it was more like an internal project in our work group that we just used to create data visualizations um, for, for our purposes. And then we were approached by Plotly, the company that's uh, also behind this open core Plotly.js library. Um, and they sponsored like this uh, 2.0 release of the library. And you can all, uh, also see we, uh, as we moved there, so the library was called differently then, back then, uh, after renaming it to Plotly.net and moving to this uh, organization, the, the thing really started to get going. Uh, and I also think um, being early on uh, F Sharp Weekly, this, is, this was like um, I tweeted about uh, a new high quality documentation page for the repository and that got picked up there in F Sharp Weekly and then it really went up there, which was quite cool. Uh, also Matthias uh, posted uh, a blog post about the, um, the library and we even managed to actually publish a software paper on the design principles of the library. I'm not sure if that had, had any, any impact on the star count, but it still got out. I think the most likely impactful things happened down here. Okay, but there are, I think, some internal factors that we can, uh, as library uh, maintainers, influence. Um, and that is like API design specifics and offering high quality documentations and samples for a tool like this. So before I go into detail about that, how this library handles it, I think it makes sense to take a short look at how Plotly works. So what Plotly does, it's, it provides this declarative JSON schema for data visualization. So you have basically this uh, top level object which has three attributes, data, layout, and config. And data basically holds all of the stuff that you want to visualize and also how you want to visualize it. So this uh, schema here basically says I have a scatter trace, scattered uh, uh, points basically. I, also, uh, I only want to show the markers and this is my data. So uh, if you then in like a JavaScript environment go there, use this plotly.newplot uh, function, you will end up with something like this. This chart actually has like lines on my screen, but I can't see them here, so just believe me that they are there. So uh, we can see some core challenges with like wrapping a JSON schema in a, in a statically typed language, right? Because the schema itself allows different and even sometimes arbitrary types for the uh, members that are on there. So it's not like that we know we have to give it a string. We can also give it uh, an object, an array, stuff like that. And as you maybe know, f -sharp is a statically typed language, so a thing like this is quite hard to do there. So um, because also, additionally to that, all of these attributes are optional, so you have this like potentially deeply nested object structure, but it can also be just this thing here. Uh, it's quite hard to achieve with this like standard records type domain modeling approach, right? So the solution we came up with for, for that is creating increasingly typed abstractions on top of a dynamic core. And I think there will be some words uh, Matthew will not like, I will say the word inheritance one time, only one time, I promise, after this one. <laughs> so um, the concept we came up with is that everything that you can do in Plotly.js must be possible, um, but common task must be very easy and also like feel f sharp -y. And we also wanted to use uh, reuse established patterns, that's why I said the high-level API is uh, heavily influenced by uh, other plotting libraries uh, in the f -sharp ecosystem. So the basic layer or, or low-level layer in this library um, is based on a thing called dynamic object. And it basically enables us to walk a little bit around the type safety of f -sharp, which is well encapsulated, I promise, but in this case we, we uh, figured we have to do it. So what we can do here is we can 
create a custom type that inherits from this dynamic object. And this will lead this type to having, uh, uh, being able to access this uh, question mark operator, which we then can then assign uh, arbitrary named values with any kind of type. So internally, this is just like a dictionary that has as of type a string object uh, and uh, some uh, secret source put on top of that. Um, but everything at the low level is built on that concept. So um, how would that look like if you would create a chart? So this um, uh, plotly JS JSON schema on the left. So you would create like this trace object here, then set with the exactly uh, same names, x and y, your data on that, set the mode to markers, do everything here, um, also set these nested objects, so you create a title object and a layout object, style the title, and then put the title object onto the layout. And then there is some, you can see here these are the equivalents of, of these two objects. And then there's also this boilerplate code here down there that you need to use. So because this is only a, a trace object data, um, but a chart, as you have seen, consists of more of that, we create that of a single trace object and then set the layout. So generic chart is like this, sorry, um, in, uh, central type that Plotly.net handles. Um, it's basically a union case representation because uh, for plot Plotly, something um, that has multiple traces is different from a chart that has a single trace because while you can have multiple, sorry, traces, you can only have one layout type on that. So that has like some implications because you have to like combine these objects, the styling on that those objects. Okay. So you can basically create any valid plotly JSON uh, with that. But you also have to, as I, uh, Thomas put it uh, in his talk, be like the creator of the plotly JS JSON schema to use it efficiently. You will have to know all of these names here. You have to know that title is an object that has to go onto the layout, stuff like that. But you don't want to. Uh, be forced to do all of this, to know all of this, because you want just uh, put some x, y points out there, right? So um, the next uh, abstraction layer are object mappings. So this adds type safety, finally, um, to, to this whole mess. And also type style parameters. So what I mean with that is mode actually is on the schema a thing that only allows certain types of strings, so like markers, lines, stuff like that. So what we can do in F Sharp is create a union case out of that, right? And also, what we have here is like these constructor-like functions, um, which only allow you to set like a subset of the possible values, but with type safety. These are the equivalents here again. You still have to know the title is a title object, but you at least get that information because you already know in that function title is of type title. Um, yeah, so this like closely mirrors this declarative syntax of the JSON schema. Um, you have to know less about the plotty JSON schema itself, but you are also only able to do a subset of what Plotly is capable of. But a large subset. And now coming to the thing that people usually, I think, use the most if they come in contact with this library, that is the like high-level chart API. So what we are doing here is every type of visualization is a chart, and we have these chart um, functions. I promise there's no combo chart. Uh, combining charts is a, a function itself as well. So. The whole thing that I've showed you before in that API is just this here. I want to create a point chart. This is my data. Oh, and also add a title on top of that. This, which creates also this JSON again. And you, for this, you don't even have to know that Plotly itself doesn't know what a point chart is. It only knows scatter traces, 
And the point chart is a scatter trace showing only markers. You don't have to know that. You just put there, do a point chart, and give it a title. You don't have to know the title as an object as well. So what you can then do is like have this incremental pipeline for styling or composing your chart, right? So you can put a title on there after you created it from data. You can then put an x-axis title there as well and go like really deep down. Uh, you don't have to know anything about Plotly.js, actually. You just have to use this API layer to create visualizations. And this API layer can also be like adapted to support other chart backends. And how does this work internally? So we have, like, as I said, these huge amount of possible attributes, which are all uh, optional. So how can we create like a function that just does not have 70 times none in there for all of the optional values, right? Because that would, would be the thing you would have to do with putting a pure function there. Um, so what we ended up with is on these types you already have, put a static member that takes optional attributes, uh, sorry, optional arguments, and then returns a function which as input takes a chart. So what you do there is, I create a function which will do things to the chart based on the things I put in there, and then I can go on and do this pipeline styling with these kind of functions. Okay, so this is uh, the, the library design principle, basically. So what can we learn from that? I think uh, everyone will agree that like the visibility of some, creating something like this to the user community is very important so these like external success factors i think having this like recognizable uh, github organization that it was put under like plotly was really helping and i think ever's lab can basically be that for data science projects uh, blog posts also really help, so Timo already showed you that we are trying to generate content for that ourselves as well. And uh, now that Twitter is not Twitter anymore, I cannot query the API, uh, but I think if I would overlay the uh, star chart with the times where I actually tweeted about the project, I think you could see there's like a correlation between those tweets and like increase in star count, so obviously this visibility um, was there for those. Um, also, I think we should be quite pr pragmatic about API choices. I mean, you saw some really non f sharp stuff right here. Sorry for that. But you, if, as long as you hide that and offer a high-quality um, API on top of that, um, where it makes, makes sense, uh, I think this is the right approach for something like this. Yeah, and obviously making this high-level uh, API layer is very important. Also, I didn't, uh, don't have time to go into detail about this topic, um, but I think documentation is really important, especially if you create tools that, other, that you expect other people to use for building stuff. And the way I approach this is focusing on the API reference, so like creating these XML documentations, so you can uh, use tools for that uh, um, create nice websites based on that, and then afterwards add step-by-step uh, -step examples. Uh, last remarks from my side. I think we uh, should not dismiss uh, C-sharp co uh, compatibility. Um, I actually implemented a c -sharp layer for Plotly.net because there are some quirks between uh, using optional parameters in these uh, F-sharp and C-sharp languages. But I think after I did that, uh, my user base basically exploded. So I also uh, got messages from companies that wanted to sponsor development of that layer. And so it seems like um, it's something that is also needed in that uh, ecosystem, right? Um, and also, Last side note, I think we need more people that are willing and able to review F-sharp software papers because we were like three or five, uh, four months in the review process until they actually found someone to review that paper that they accepted, um, which then was a Java developer. So I guess we should like maybe form like a pool of willing individuals uh, that can do this. 
So, okay, with that, thanks for your attention. And I hope you uh, will put your questions, if you have any, on the board. Thank you.